Jesse Ollus. And welcome to Mr. This is Europe, and here's Greece. Now, Bame, that's it. Greece sits among the most ancient of the nations, and by Neolithic times was producing skilled artisans. These strange-looking marble figures were carved by the mysterious Cycladic culture, but the first advanced civilization of Europe arose on the Greek island of Crete, known to us as the Minoans. The Minoans are also something of a riddle, but seem to have had it pretty good. There's not really any evidence of warfare among them, but there's dolphins, and bull leaping, and fishing. I can't think of a Bronze Age people with a more cheerful form of art than the Minoans. They were also clever constructionists, building big palaces and sewerage systems, and writing in a script which no one's deciphered, and trading with their neighbours across the seas. Then, after a thousand years or so, they slowly declined, but not before they'd influenced the people on the Greek mainland, whom we know as the Mycenaeans. They were not as refined or elegant as the Minoans, in fact, they were rather rough and brutish, but great warriors, with helmets made from the tusks of boars. They developed the earliest written form of the Greek language, and it is in Mycenaean times that most of the mythic Greek heroes are said to have lived. Perseus, Heracles, Achilles, Odysseus, and so on. Then everything fell to pieces pretty violently in the late Bronze Age collapse, and invasion and city sacking and population reduction followed. Greece capsized into what's commonly called a Dark Age for centuries, and writing and advancement mostly stopped. More light begins to trickle in as we tread into the Archaic Era, and some truly big things start happening. There was the establishment of the polis, for instance. Rather than being a single political entity, Greece became a patchwork of fiercely independent city-states like Athens, Corinth, Thebes, and Sparta, something Greece's mountainous geography undoubtedly had a hand in. The Greeks adopted an alphabet from Phoenicia, but added letters for vowels, the first to do so. In this new alphabet, around the 8th century BC, a man named Homer is believed to have written the wondrous epic poems the Iliad and Odyssey, thus inaugurating Western literature. The Greeks also started having some fun, initiating the Olympic Games, and then going on to build big temples and founding colonies all over the place from Spain to the Ukraine. Then you had mathematicians like Pythagoras, and philosophers like Thales who predicted an eclipse and Cleisthenes who formulated a system of government known as democracy in Athens. <gasps> You might be asking, what magic is this? Why did the Greeks suddenly burst out in unheard of barrages of brilliance? That's a very, very good question. Anyway, while all this was going on, a shadow was approaching from the east, the Persians. By the 5th century BC, the Achaemenid Persians had gobbled up a colossal empire, gulping down Greek regions in the process. And when the Greeks here revolted against foreign rule, with support from Athens and Eretria, and burned the Persian regional capital, the Persians under King Darius quashed the rebellion and vowed to invade Greece and make it pay. Persia at this point had the biggest empire history had ever known, and they marched into Greece, and of course Greece had absolutely no chance, and oh wait, the Greeks won. In a startling twist, the Athenians and Plataeans under Miltiadis routed the Persians at the Battle of Marathon, and sent them packing. One Greek even tried to pull a Persian ship back with his hands. Ten years later, the Persians returned, this time with a much, much bigger army. The multi-ethnic forces swept in by land and sea, and met with ferocious resistance, most famously from Leonidas and his 300 Spartans and their allies at the Battle of Thermopylae, where for three days the Greeks held their ground against a force at least ten times their size. Meanwhile, the wily Athenian Themistocles scored a victory for the Greek fleet at Salamis, after tricking the Persians into some narrow straits to their destruction. When the Greeks under Spartan general Bophsanias triumphed at the Battle of Plataea, the Persian conquest was effectively stopped, and a jubilant confidence infected the Greek world. Greece in the 5th century BC entered its classical phase, an age of cultural scintillation. The apex of it all was in Athens under Pericles, who sought to beautify the city after the Persians had burned it, and did so. The Parthenon, that sparkling Doric temple to Athena crowning the Acropolis, proving the most spectacular structural symbol of the age. Greece's golden era birthed the immeasurably influential philosopher Socrates, who taught Plato, who taught Aristotle. Sculptors fashioned artworks of astonishing skill. We meet Herodotus, known as the father of history, and Hippocrates, known as the father of medicine. Meanwhile, playwrights entertained crowds in theatres with their comedies and tragedies. But Athens had attained great wealth and power, and other Greek states were getting weary especially Sparta. And of course the two ended up at each other's throats. Enter the Peloponnesian War, a devastating conflict that eventually saw the Spartans victorious and Athens humiliated. The Thebans later enjoyed a time of supremacy, but then along came Macedon. Macedon, or Macedonia, was the northernmost spot of the Greek world, but viewed as something of a backwater. The Macedonians spoke a Greek dialect, worshipped the Greek gods, and competed in the Olympics, which only Greeks were allowed to do. But they didn't think much of the whole democracy thing, and preferred the Homeric warrior king system of our old rugged 
friends the Mycenaeans. Macedon's ascent was the result of an able king called Philip II, who reformed the Macedonian army, subdued his enemies, and unified most of Greece under his rule before being assassinated and succeeded by his young son, Alexander. Alexander was even more ambitious and ruthless than his father, and set off to punish Persia for their invasion of Greece once and for all. In an extraordinary campaign which evinced his military genius, and after numerous battles, none of which he lost, he conquered the Persian Empire and carved out a gigantic kingdom stretching from Egypt to India, before dying in Babylon aged 32. While his reign was short, his legacy was not, and the language and culture of Greece spread through the Eastern world. Alexander's empire ended up split into different bits, these two proving the strongest, and the city of Alexandria in Egypt became the intellectual capital of the Western world for centuries. But next door waxed a ravenous beast called Rome, and after a number of wars, the Romans conquered Greece in 146 BC, and over the next century snapped up the other Greek-run regions around the Mediterranean. Though subjugated, the culture of Greece permeated Rome, and educated and artistic Romans constantly looked to Greece for inspiration. It was during Roman rule in the first century that a strange new religion called Christianity came to Greece, the Apostle Paul himself preaching in Athens and founding churches across the land. Thanks to Alexander, Greek was the common language of the Eastern Roman Empire, and Christianity could spread very quickly, and it did, and the New Testament was originally written in Greek. While the early church suffered persecution, it only grew the more, and eventually became the favoured faith of both the Eastern and Western Roman Empire. When Western Rome fell in 476, the Eastern Empire, including Greece, survived the fall and would last another thousand years. This Byzantine Empire, with its glittering capital at Constantinople, was strengthened by Justinian I, under whom it reached its peak in power. But it was surrounded by enemies and war was the norm. While the 11th and 12th centuries saw Byzantine Greece prosper quite a bit, there were simply too many people trying to conquer it. Italians were pinching islands, and the Serbs snatched half the mainland, and then the Turks came along. When Constantinople finally fell to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, Greece soon followed. The Greeks did not do very well under Ottoman rule. Heavy taxes, discrimination, and having their children stolen to be forcibly converted to Islam and serve as soldiers or civil servants. When Greek monks had to build their monasteries this far away from the ground, you just know something wasn't right. The Greek Orthodox Church played a big part in keeping the hopes of the Greeks alive, and we hear about bishops like Dionysius here leading revolts. He, unfortunately, was captured and flayed alive. This was also the time of the rough, mountain-dwelling rebels, the Kleftis, who constantly harassed the Turkish authorities. By the 18th century, the Ottoman Empire was no longer the superpower it used to be, and Greek intellectuals like Adamandios, Korais, and Rigas Ferreos, influenced by the French Enlightenment, were opening people's minds to new ideas and urging revolution. In 1821, Greece was set ablaze in a war of independence, a time of bravery and bloodlust. The Greeks scored major victories under leaders like Theodoros Kolokotronis, who thrashed the Turks at their Vanaikia. Greek women also joined the fight, with Mando, Mavrogenos, and Lascarino Bobolina donating their wealth and commanding ships in the struggle. Now Greeks were utterly ruthless to their enemy, slaughtering the thousands of Turks captured at Tripolitsa. But it was the Turkish atrocities against the Greeks, from the tens of thousands butchered in Hios, to the massacres and beheadings at Mesolongi, that awoke the great powers. Europe and the Western world had already been sympathetic to the Greek cause, but now they decided to take serious action. This was very welcome, as the Ottomans had enlisted the help of Egypt, and things were not looking good. In 1827, the British, Russians, and French destroyed the Ottoman navy at Navarino. The Greeks fought on and finally won their freedom. The country was in shambles and recovery was slow, but the Greeks were ardent on liberating their brethren still in Ottoman lands, and disappointment followed losses against the Turks in 1897. Before this, however, under Prime Minister Kharilaos Trikopis, improvements had been made and modernization encouraged, and Greece hosted the first modern Olympic Games. The Greek Spiridon Louis winning the marathon, no doubt thanks to his magnificent moustache. Anyway, under Eleftherios Venizelos, the Greek state managed to double in size and population, and fought on the winning side in World War I, after which the Greeks invaded Turkey to regain the lands their ancestors once had possessed. After making significant gains, the Turkish offensive in 1922 forced the Greek withdrawal. This was not a good time, as the Turks had been busy with their Greek genocide, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of Greeks in their borders before the 1923 population exchange. Then there was the Great Depression, political upheaval, and World War II. While Greece sought neutrality, the Italians under Mussolini invaded in 1940, but the Greeks surprised everyone by holding them off and pushing them back. This compelled Nazi Germany to intervene, and their incursion proved unstoppable. Though Hitler himself was impressed by the heroism of the Greek soldiers, Greece suffered horribly in these years of occupation. Factories, farms, and whole villages were torched. Thousands starved to death or were executed, though the Greek resistance managed to kill many thousands of enemy soldiers. But before the war was even over, another war began engulfing Greece, a civil war which ended with the government defeating the communists. Ruined Greece had to rebuild again, and did so 
NATO and joined NATO and the economy grew, but political reform was stymied and a repressive right-wing military regime ruled from 1967 to 74 when Mr. Karamanlis restored democracy. Greece went on to join the EU in 1981 and it began to prosper, but as Noel Coward once sang, there are bad times just around the corner and they appeared in the wake of the global financial crisis and Greece was hit very hard only to be strained further by the migrant crisis. But Greece, which has survived so much worse, can confidently hope in tomorrow and today has attained a very high level of human development with a high standard of living and is one of the world's top tourist destinations. Greece has given the world so much in art and architecture, in literature and philosophy, in science and mathematics, and in sport. The food's really good too, by the way. So that's it for Greece, and that's all from me for now. Bye-bye!